If you happen to be here for the first time, I want to welcome you. And uh, if you will visit ARC Info in the lobby, we have a gift for you. We'd love to give you a gift. And, um, and if you're not here for the first time, I'm glad you're here tonight. It's a be been a beautiful day, and it's dry. It's not raining. Great, huh? <laughs> Well, tonight um, I want to share a stewardship scripture with you, and then I am real excited about what the Lord has put on my heart for you tonight. So let's, let's get started. And I have in my contact so I can see the, sign, the time tonight. Last week I couldn't see that far back. Um, our stewardship tonight, you want to put it up for me? Our stewardship is found in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. If you remember last week, we talked about meditating on the Word, and I told you that I read Proverbs 3 every day this year, and this is one of the scriptures that I love to meditate on there. This one talks about prosperity. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That is a promise for prosperity. You know, that chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, covers everything in your life. You just ought to read it this week for sure. But let's talk just a minute about that. Uh, if, you, if, if you honor the Lord with all of your goods, all, everything that you own, all of your possessions, what does that mean? What does it mean to honor the Lord? I think the first thing it means is to understand that anything you own, anything you possess comes from God. Everything you have, he released into your hand. He gave you the responsibility of that thing. He gave you the blessing of those things. And so this is how you honor him. You're grateful. You're grateful. There's hardly a day goes by that when I get up in the morning, I don't thank the Lord for my health. I am so grateful to be strong. I'm so grateful that I can get out of bed without pain. I'm so grateful that I can walk downstairs and back upstairs without pain. I'm grateful. I know that's a gift from the Lord. We live in a lovely home, and I don't take it for granted. I thank the Lord almost every time I drive into our driveway. I thank the Lord for our home. It's a gift from Him. You say, well, you paid for it, but He gave me the money to pay for it. So it's a gift from the Lord. So that's how you honor the Lord with everything that you have. When you sit down and you're eating a meal and it's a good, it's a good meal, or if, even if it's just a hamburger, and that's good, especially if you're on a diet and not supposed to eat them. <laughs> but, but you need to be grateful for that. There are people in the world that have nothing to eat. And so, you know, my mother used to tell me, that uh, I should think of all the little hungry children in the world if I didn't clean my plate. And I do think of them, not just because I don't clean my plate, but I do think of the people in the world. And when you pray the Lord's Prayer and you, say, and you pray, give us this day our daily bread, think of all those people all over the world and, and include them in that prayer. Lord, all the people in the world that are starving, send food. If there's a way I can help feed them, show me. Show me. Thank you for what you've given me. And thank you for the opportunity to share what you've given me. Because that's the next part. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. What are the first fruits of your increase? Well, if you were a farmer, it's the first of the crop that goes to the Lord. If you have a job, it's right off the top. You know, if you wait till the bottom to give to the Lord, you won't give to the Lord. You'll get ready to write that check and that money will be gone. So he says, give off the top. And this is why you give off the top. When you give to the Lord off the top, the first fruits of your income, you're saying, Lord, I trust you with the rest of this money. I know you're going to multiply. You're going to help. You're going to see that my needs are met. He says over in Corinthians, I will cause my grace, my unmerited favor to abound in your life. So you will always have a sufficiency to meet all of your needs and plenty left over to give to every good work. Now, there's a blessing that goes with this. Verse 10 says, if you do that, if you honor the Lord with all your possessions, if you give him the first fruits of your income, that then he will cause your barns to be filled. Now, I don't happen to own a barn. I, I don't, I do any, a lot of you probably have barns. Y'all have barns? Anybody here got a barn? Let me see your hands if you have a barn. Well, the Lord's going to fill it up. But that's really not what he's talking about. For me, the barn is my bank account. He's going to make sure I have a balance in my bank account. 
He's going to make, he, it says, my barns will be filled and my vats will overflow. So the Lord is going to take care of you. He will take care of you. The more you trust the Lord, and we're really going to talk about that tonight, the more you learn to trust the Lord, the more the Lord can release into your hands. So give. Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits. And watch and see if the Lord will not cause your accounts to be filled up and your balance to increase and bless you beyond your wildest dreams. Did that help you a little bit? Three people were blessed. I'm so glad. (laughs) Tonight, um, I want to talk to you about a little word called confidence. Confidence. Actually, and I'll I'll say this again, but um, confidence comes from a Latin word that has actually two Latin words. The first one is con, and it uh, or the first Latin word is con, and it means with. We get our English word with, and the second one is fidence, and I'm sure I didn't say that right. With, uh, and that means faith. So confidence really means with faith. So if you have confidence, you have faith. You have assurance. You have confidence. If you ask me, and some people do occasionally ask me questions, if if you ask me, what was my greatest desire spiritually in life? I would tell you this, and this is nothing new. This has been my greatest desire in, in life probably for most of my adult life. I want to be a woman of prayer, and I want to be a woman of faith. I really want that. I want to know my God, and I know that I know my God through prayer and through confidence, faith in Him. And because I want that, and I want it so badly, I pursue it. I pursue becoming a woman of prayer. I make time to pray. I I pray all the time. And in fact, I I drive my daughter and my husband crazy sometimes because I just sing all the time and I pray all the time. You never know when I'm going to burst into song. You'll say something that reminds me of a song and I'll start singing. Or anything will come up and I'll start praying. I just love to pray. It's so important. But it's not just enough to pray. You got to have that other thing, faith. You have to pray with faith. There's a scripture, I don't have it in my notes, sorry, Carrie. There's a scripture in James chapter 5, verse 15 that says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. And uh, one translation says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Don't you like that? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman makes, makes a power avail, great power available, dynamic in its working. In stewardship last week, I, uh, I taught you on stewardship from Galatians chapter 6. And in verse 9 of Galatians chapter 6, it says, In due season, we will reap if we don't get discouraged and if we don't give up. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Because in our prayer life, in our faith life, it's easy to get discouraged and it's easy to give up. Because of the time that I've spent pursuing prayer and faith, I've become like a... Have you ever seen a little dog with a toy and played with them? I used to have a poodle. My schnauzer is not interested in playing like this. But my poodle loved to play, and I could shake a rag in front of her, and she'd grab it. I think I could spin her over my head, and she would not let go of that rag. I mean, that dog, she would grab hold of it. And that's the way I am in prayer. When I really decide that I've found a promise and I believe in God, and I have a need, I grab hold of that need like that dog, and I will not let go. I'm like, uh, it it was uh, Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. And the night his name was changed to Israel, he wrestled with the Lord. And the Lord said, you've got to let me go. He said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. And he hung on, and he got a blessing, didn't he? He said, okay, I'm changing your name. Now, he walked with a limp the rest of his life, but he was, he was an extremely blessed man. I want to be an extremely blessed woman. How about you? We talked about being blessed last week. But you're going to get that blessing if you learn how to be a person who is persistent in prayer and faith. Matthew 7, 7 is a scripture that I use real often when I'm teaching on prayer because it gives you three vital ingredients to an effective, fervent prayer. 
And it goes like this. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It says this in Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will open to you. For whoever seeks, or everyone that seeks, or asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door opens. Now, that little scripture gives you three vital ingredients that I sometimes teach for an hour on these three little ingredients, but I'm only going to teach for two minutes on them because I think you need to see this to understand where I want to take us tonight in prayer and faith. The first ingredient for any prayer is asking. It's petition. And people think, some people think that's the end of prayer. You just go to the Lord and ask him for something. But actually, there are three vital ingredients listed here, and Jesus is the one talking about this. Asking is your petition. Now, we've got that one down. I, my name is Jimmy, and I'll, give all, I'll take all you give me, Lord. Just give me, give me, give me, give me. We got that one down, don't we? we? I need this, Lord. I need that, Lord. Lord, could you do this? Lord, could you do that? Oh, Lord, now give me a parking place. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know how we women pray. Let that dress go on sale, Lord. <laughs> Don't let anybody buy it till it does. <laughs> that's how women pray. But that's the first ingredient. Say ask. I want to hear a better ask than that. Ask. That's good. The second ingredient is seek. Seek and you shall find. You say, what in the world does that have to do with prayer? Do you know God says that he will never let his word return void. So when you pray, you need to find a promise in the Bible that goes with your petition. And you say, how do you do that? Well, if you don't know, and we won't have time to go into it in great detail tonight, come see me and I'll show you how. Or I have a little book on prayer that'll give you scriptures to stand on for all sorts of things. But you've got to find a promise that goes with your, with your need. For instance... If you've got a child that's not serving the Lord, did you know in the book of Isaiah, there's a wonderful scripture that says, all of your children will be disciples, taught of the Lord, and great will be the peace of your children. Did you know that's in the Bible? It's in the Bible. You can grab that. If you're believing for someone's salvation, you know there's a scripture in 1 John that says, if we ask anything according to God's will, he hears us. And if he hears us, then we can have the petition that we desired of him. And there's another scripture that says, it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all human beings should come to repentance. So if you're believing for someone's salvation, you can grab those two scriptures, put them together, go to the Father and say, look what I found. Here's the promise that goes with my petition. I know you're going to save that person because you, you don't want anybody to perish and you want this person to come to repentance. And I'm praying according to your will so I know you hear me so I know I have my petition. That's, how, that's the promise. Say the promise. So you've got to have a petition. Then you need the promise. Now what about that knocking part? And if you knock, the door will open. Well, that's an interesting part of prayer. If I go to your house, now it would say ring the doorbell instead of knock because we all have doorbells, very few of us knock. But if you came to my house and you knocked on my door, what would you be doing? You would be, you would be asking me to come open the door, wouldn't you? You'd be calling me to come open the door. And if I came to your house and I knocked on your door and you were my friend and I knew you were in there and you didn't come right away, I would keep knocking. In fact, if you were my friend and I knew you were in there and you weren't coming to the door and I smelled chocolate chip cookies... I would go to the back door and I would knock. Or I would go to the window in the kitchen and I would knock. But I would keep knocking. Now, you know what? That's what you have to do in prayer. Once you've asked the Lord for something, then you have to go to him with that promise. And I pray it like this. Lord, you said. Lord, you said. This is what you said and I believe it. And I'm just going to keep bringing your word to you until you open that door for me until I receive that blessing. The problem is that waiting part, that knocking part. How long do you have to knock? How long do you think you have to knock? Till it opens, as long as it takes. As long as it takes, you just got to keep knocking, keep knocking, keep praying. And sometimes it's a long time. 
Now, some things happen while you're waiting, but, but the main thing, and probably the main scripture I want to bring to you tonight is found in Hebrews 10, 35. This, uh, you know, I always talk about our Tuesday prayer times when our staff prays for all of you. And uh, one, a couple of weeks ago, this verse came up in our prayer time and it won't leave my spirit. And so when I started praying about what I was going to share tonight, the Lord took me to this verse. This is what it says in Hebrews 10, 35. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. King James says, have patience. The new King James says, you need to have endurance. So three different words, three different, probably there's more words than that in different translations, but the three I looked at. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now I looked up those three words, persevere, endurance, and patience, to help us understand that last part of prayer that's difficult that knocking part, that persevering part, that waiting part. So many times we have to wait. You know, I've had a couple of of almost instant healings in my body, and they're just great. But probably 95% of the things the Lord has healed me of took a while. A number of years ago, I had arthritis in both of my hips. I really didn't know that's what it was until my cousin told me that everybody in our family had it. She said, it's going to get worse, you know. We all had it. Your mother had hip replacement. My mother had bad hips. My sister had hip replacement. We all have it. You know, it made me mad when she said that. I said, well, you can have it if you want to. (laughs) But I don't want it. Well, she laughed. She said, well, you have it. And she was a minister. I can't believe she said that to me. I said, I'm not going to have it. Immediately, immediately, I went to the Word. Immediately, I put my petition in. I don't want arthritis. I don't want it, Lord. I know that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. But I did more than just find those general healing scriptures. I found some bone scriptures because I wanted strong bones. And I began, and it took two years of knocking But that's been many years ago, and my hips are just fine. The Lord healed me. The Lord completely healed me. So sometimes it takes time, but you can't give up. You can't cast away your confidence and say, well, it just isn't working. It just isn't working. It took 25 years of praying for my husband to get him saved, but thank God he got saved. And now he's a maniac for Jesus. Perseverance. Here's the definition of perseverance. To continue on a course of action, even in the face of difficulty or with little or no prospect of success. It's staying power. When everybody around you is saying, oh, you know, just quit believing for that. That's not going to happen. Just smile and say, thank you very much, but I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep believing. This is what endurance is. Very similar word. The power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process without giving way or quitting. In due season, you will reap if you don't get discouraged and if you don't quit. Here's the last one, patience. Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Some people get mad at God if he doesn't answer right away. Give me patience, Lord, do it quick. My mama used to say, never pray for patience because the Bible says tribulation worketh patience. Well, let me announce to you, you're going to have tribulation whether you have patience or not. So pray for patience. You need it. The ability to continue to do the right thing until the answer comes. I like that definition. Patience is the ability to just keep doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing until the answer comes. All three of those words have to do with time and waiting. None of us likes to wait. I don't like to wait in line, do you? Oh, brother. When I get on the freeway and, it was, and it's backed up, oh, I, I don't like that. I, it was backed up tonight coming in. And we just don't like that. I want to get in the fast lane and go fast. I'm with Pastor. I'm the one behind him. <laughs> you never have to wait for him to slow down. Don't tell him I said that. But it's true. He'll tell you that. Hebrews 10.35 again. So do not throw away your confidence. 
or cast away your confidence it, because it will be richly rewarded. For you have need of patience so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now, I could stop there tonight and, and finish teaching you there tonight, but there's something else in this passage of Scripture a little further that I want to show you because faith helps us persevere. You know, I want to be a woman of prayer, and I want to be a woman of faith because just prayer without faith will not get the job done. You need both. You need to be a person of prayer, and you need to be a person of faith. Faith helps us persevere. Faith helps us endure. Faith helps us be patient until our answer comes. If we go on in Hebrews 10 to verses 38 and 39, they read like this. My righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Wow. My righteous one shall live by faith, and I take no pleasure in those who shrink back. Now, what did he mean, I take no pleasure in those? Does he mean I don't like you anymore if you shrink back? If you don't stand in faith, I'm going to be mad at you? No, that's not what he means. He means I can't give you your promise if you step out of faith. Everything you get from God, you get by faith. You get by believing. You get by having confidence in him. And if you step out of faith, God can't give you what you want. And, you know, he, if you're wishy-washy, don't be wishy-washy. Don't say, I believe God today and tomorrow say, I don't know. I don't guess God's going to do it. You sound like Eeyore. I don't know. No, you got to live by faith. Did you know that little statement, the just shall live by faith, is found at least four times in the Bible? It must be important. It's found in Hebrews 12, 38, where we just read. It's found in Habakkuk in the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 4. It's found in Galatians, chapter 3, verse 11, and in Romans, chapter 1, verse 17. Four times in the Bible, the Lord said the just are the justified. We're the justified ones. We're justified through the blood of Jesus. We will live by faith. Not you might, if you want to. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's a command. Well, I don't know if I have faith. Oh, yeah, you got faith. We all have faith. But you can make your faith stronger. Your faith is the muscle of your spirit. Let me say that again. Your faith is the muscle of your spirit. Did you know, I don't care how skinny and frail you look, if you go to the gym and work on yourself, you can build muscle. I don't care how old you are. They say no matter how old I get, I can still build muscle. I'm, I'm not trying right now. But, <laughs> but they say I can, so I won't give up. But I know this. Maybe my natural muscles are just sort of covered with a thin layer of fat to protect them. But my spirit muscle, man, if you could see my spirit, looks like Miss Atlas. Because I, I work on my faith muscle all the time. I take time to exercise my faith muscle. I exercise it in all sorts of little silly things. So when the big things come, it's strong. It's ready. I take no pleasure. I can't give you what you're asking if you step out of faith. Faith, confidence. The confidence in God and his willingness to give us his promise. So cast not away your confidence. Don't throw it away. But this is the problem. A lot of people say, well, you know, I hear what you're saying, but, and I've really tried, but I can't change. I just am who I am, and I can't change. I've tried to overcome this weakness, but I can't change. Or maybe you hear this in your head. Well, it's your circumstances. You can have all the faith you want to, but I'm just here to tell you, your circumstances are not going to change. Oh, all circumstances are subject to change. All circumstances are subject to change. Or how about this one? Well, you could just pray for that, that husband. You could just pray for that daughter. You could just pray for that friend until you're blue in the face. But God isn't going to violate their will to do what you're praying about. Well, if I'm praying his word, he, doesn't, he couldn't care less about their will. He cares about his word. He cares. Now, you say, uh, are you sure? Well, concerning their salvation, he won't violate their will. Concerning anything else you're praying about, the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Didn't say it was a good king or a bad king. Just said it was the king. 
And, and the Lord can turn that heart just like he turns a river. Yes, God can intervene. Yes, God can do that. So let's talk a minute about time and waiting and these questions. Can I change? Can my circumstances change? Will, will that person that I'm praying for, interceding for, will they change? I want to take you to another scripture, a very familiar scripture, one of my favorite scriptures. It's found in Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 is about worship, but Romans 12, 2 is about the progression of change. See, change in prayer, spiritually, change happens first inside, and then you see it on the outside. That's the way change happens. Before you'll see evidence of your healing on the outside, if you're believing for healing, you'll feel it on the inside. You'll get a peace on the inside. Before you see that person get saved that you've been praying for, and I'll give you some scriptures to pray over that, but before you see that person come to Jesus, you're going to get a peace on the inside that the work has been done. You're going to have a, every, almost everything you're praying for out here has to change in here first. It's called transformation. Now listen to this, Romans 12 two. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that's our problem. We have a human mind, and we let the world dictate what we think. You'll start believing for something, and people around you that are not believers will begin to tell you every reason in the world that that's not going to happen for you. I've even had spirit, I have, I once had, a, I was believing for something really big in my life. It was something, it was an urgent matter in my life, and I was believing God for it. And I was working at a church as a choir director at the time, and that pastor said, that isn't going to happen. He said that to me. And you know what I said back to him? Because I already had the peace in my heart. I said, yes, it is, and when it does, you're going to take me to lunch. And he did. He and his wife took me to lunch because they were wrong. I knew I'd had the word. I found the word on it. I was believing God for it. I was confessing. It took a little time, but it happened. Now, you can't let the world dictate what you think. And the enemy can't get to your spirit, but he sure can invade your thinking. The Bible says in Ephesians concerning spiritual warfare that you have a shield of faith. Your faith is a shield that will stop the fiery darts of the enemy that he hits toward your mind. You need that shield of faith because the enemy is going to try to attack your mind while you're trying to believe God. Maybe you're caught up in some habit or, or some weakness and you don't think you'll ever get free. And the enemy says, that's who you are. You'll never change. You'll never change. You'll never change. you got to just put up that shield of faith and say, I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. See, that's what it says. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, it's two parts. Our part, this is our part, is to decide not to allow the world to press its impressions, its thoughts, its way of living on us in our mind. God's part is to transform us. I think about, you know, that word transformation comes from a Greek word. We get our English word metamorphosis from that word. That's what happens to a caterpillar when it turns into a butterfly. I don't know about you, I'm not wild about caterpillars. They're nasty little creatures. I don't want them crawling on me. I don't want them on my tummy. It really upsets me if I cut something open, there's a worm inside. Oh, I don't like that. One of the problems with the caterpillar, and you have that caterpillar phase. You need to be transformed out of that caterpillar stage. Caterpillars, it's all about them. All they want to do is eat. If you don't believe it, put a caterpillar on your tomato plant. And come out the next morning, and you will discover that skinny worm is no longer skinny. He was just a couple inches long when you put him on the plant, but now he's six inches long, and there are no more leaves on the plant. He just is, he's a consumer. He's self-centered. He's a consumer. He doesn't know God has a plan for his life. Some of you are like that. You don't know God has a plan for your life. Every time you go to God, it's just about you. You don't realize that during this time of waiting, God wants to make some changes on the inside of you. He wants to begin to transform you into something beautiful. You know, a butterfly is nothing like a caterpillar. 
I'm just delighted if a butterfly lights on my hand. They're just beautiful. And, you know, they have a very short life, but their life is a lovely life. They, they bring life. They take pollen from one flower to another. They're wonderful little creatures. They, they live for their purpose that God has given them. That's what God wants us to do. Let me share one little personal story, and then I'm going to close. When my daughter, when we first moved to the Woodlands, my daughter was, uh, had just come out of junior high. And, or maybe she was just going into junior high. I think she was just going into junior high. And um, she came from a real small school, and she came into a big school. And, and I was really concerned about her. I was praying so much about her because I, I knew it was difficult for her. She was struggling finding the group of friends that she fit in with. And I went into her room to clean her room one day, and my daughter's an artist. And I, and I just happened to open her sketchbook. And in her sketchbook, she had drawn a picture of herself. It was in a box with no windows. And she drew herself sitting in a corner with her knees drawn up and her little head on her knees. And oh, it broke my heart. I thought, oh, she feels isolated. She feels alone. This is terrible, Lord. Oh, this, this tells me. And the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, look a little closer. Look at what she drew on the wall of her cell, of her closet. And there on the wall was a little picture of a butterfly. The Lord said, in her time of, of need, in her time of depression, of feeling alone and isolated, she drew a picture of what she will become. She drew a picture of what I'm going to make of her. And God, of course, did a wonderful work in her life, and she adjusted. And you know how we are, our mothers are with children. We get upset, don't we? we? We always think the worst, but if you learn to pray in the Spirit, the Lord will show you the butterfly. And the Lord will help you get your kid through that. I want to close with this little example. Uh, in prayer Tuesday, and I may not get this right, Justin, you may have to help me out here because I'm not a football person. But we were talking about the difference in defense and offense in football. In defense, you're keeping the opponent away from the goal. That's your goal. Isn't that right? Okay. But in, I want to make sure I have it right. But in offense, you're moving the ball toward the goal. You cannot win a game if you only play defense. If you are always driving the devil off, if you are always struggling, if you are never moving forward, you're not going to possess your promise. No, we've got, to, we've got to change it tonight. We've got to get in position where we're going to grab the ball of the Word of God. We're going to get on the knee, our knees of prayer, and we're going to make up our mind that nothing is going to keep us from the promise of God. Now, let me just read in the last minute or so. Let me read this. This is a, a little excerpt from a sermon I transcribed from a guy named Jackson Sinyonga from Uganda. The whole thing was wonderful, but it was on prayer. But listen to these thoughts on prayer. Prayer brings an atmosphere in which God can stay. By praying, we create an atmosphere. Through prayer and worship, we create an atmosphere where God can stay. So you need to create that atmosphere every day. Now listen to this. Prayer puts a demand on heaven to open up. Wow. Prayer puts a demand on the heart of God to respond. Prayer changes your environment. When prayer begins to outcry the sin of the land, it begins to bring a new canopy in which God can stay. You can bring that canopy in your home. You can bring that canopy in your body. When you begin to pray and worship and praise and speak the word back to God, Lord, you said, and I believe you, you can create that canopy. Prayer will suppress the power of darkness and the glory of God will descend into your situation. Prayer is two-sided. It's an invitation to God, and it's an attack on the powers of darkness. As you, do, as you continue to pray, you suppress the powers of darkness, and you make it difficult for the enemy to stay in your life or your situation. The enemy does not feel comfortable in an environment where the presence of God has come, and the presence of God can only ride on prayer, praise, and worship. So don't cast away your confidence. Keep praying. Keep confessing the word of God. God is working behind the scenes. You will see your promise if you don't give up, if you stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Did that bless you?